Hey guys, John Paulamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today, Saturday, January 12th, 2019. And this week, uh, we're going to do a 2019 investment forecast where I'm going to talk about the uh, major themes that I'm looking at and what I'm expecting to see and how I'm positioning for the th upcoming year. So let's get right into it. So I think uh, the main thing that we're going to see is a continuation of what we were talking about late last year, and that will be expect more volatility. So where's this volatility coming from? Well, we're seeing a stock market and an economy that are 10 years old. They are fairly long in the tooth. We are seeing the indications that other areas around the world seem to be slowing down, specifically West Germany, or not West Germany, but Germany printed some negative numbers. China's printing negative numbers. We've got the trade uh, things going on between the United States and China. I think the major thing, though, that's going on is liquidity, and we're seeing liquidity being reined in. Liquidity is shrinking. The United States Federal Reserve is in the process of unwinding its balance sheet while at the same time raising short-term interest rates. This is something that's never been done before, so we really don't know the effects of what's going to happen with the markets. However, we can say that if we think that a large part of the previous bull market since the um, global financial crisis in 2008, if we attribute most of that, a lot of that move to liquidity, and the growth of liquidity by central banks as they flooded the world with uh, currency units after the crash, trying to rein that in could have the, the uh, reverse effect. So I think, I think a lot of people are nervous. I think a lot of people are selling on news items that they see. I don't trade like that. I don't operate like that. But I think that's what's going to affect us. I do think, though, that's going to provide opportunity. And I will talk about that uh, later on in the presentation. Um, I would say one thing, though, that uh, historically bull markets don't die on pessimism. They die on euphoria. Typically what we see is every last dumb dollar gets sucked into a move higher because things can't get any better. And then uh, that's typically when things roll over. Um, right now it just seems like there's so much pessimism out there. Everybody's expecting a crash. I mean, I get emails all the time. Everybody just talks about a crash. Like, this is something that happens so often. Um, crashes don't happen that often. Uh, bear markets happen, but, uh, you know, a bear market being, you know, a down move in the averages of about 20%. We've already seen some of that in a lot of the stocks that we follow. I've seen stocks that I am interested in or that I own that are down 30%, 40 40%. But I guess... Long story short, I don't predict the economy. I don't predict what's going to happen uh, with the overall geopolitical situation. What I do is look at individual companies. And when all these other forced sellers or fearful sellers sell something that I'm interested in and it goes on discount, I look at that as an opportunity. So that's what I'm expecting to see more of this year. I think it's imperative to know what you own call out the positions that you don't know why you own them. If you have stocks in there in your portfolio, you're like, why do I own this? Get rid of it. Because you need cash. You need to be accumulating cash because as we have these swings uh, inside the market, it's going to provide opportunity for people that uh, are astute and understand the positions and understand the investments they do hold. So uranium is still my number one highest conviction situation that I'm involved in. I'm not going to go through all the fundamentals. We all know that. I would say that uh, there's a continuation of uh, what we're seeing as we see supply shrink. Uh, I just saw a news item this week where the big ranger mine in Australia is finally coming. I believe it's in Australia. Finally come. No, that's Olympic Dam. Anyways, a big ranger mine. I, well, maybe it is in Australia. But anyways, it was a five million pound per year mine. It's coming to the end of its life. What you will notice in the news is you're not seeing any announcements by any mining companies about bringing on a 5 million pound per year mines. And the reason that is is because people that have capital are not going to commit capital 
to a industry or a commodity like uranium that costs 60 to $65 a pound to mine and they can only get $30 for it. I've said this before, I'll say it again, it's just amount of time. How long do we have to wait? And I try to remind people of the spot price chart that I stole off John Quakes off Twitter. Since April of last year, you've had a 42% move in the spot price of uranium. I'm not suggesting it's going to go up another 42% this year. I have no idea what it will do. But what I would say is, is that this is indicative of all of the news items that we've been reporting over the last year on the supply demand uh, fundamentals and dynamic, how it is impacting the market. Um, I have no doubt that, you know, we are living off the inertia of the previous bull market and the capital that was deployed then. There's no capital, very little capital being deployed into this, and yet reactors continue to get built. Uh, lifespans of reactors continue to get extended, and nuclear power continues to be uh, what I think is going to be the power source of the future. And I want to point out in the next slide something very interesting. There was a end of the year, I guess, Bill Gates, the former CEO of Microsoft, the billionaire philanthropist, writes a missive every year about what he is pursuing. You know, he's trying to cure polio, eradicate polio, malaria, all these things. And it was interesting what he wrote about nuclear power. And I want to go over that because this guy is an influencer. He has access. And I think... I'm starting to see a shift in narrative uh, away from flat out ignoring nuclear power and demonizing it to people that are in the uh, environmental movement and influencers like Gates are starting to warm to it. Let's go over a couple of the quotes from his letter. Um, I use the word bullish. I don't know if he's bullish, but uh, it's a good headline. These are some excerpts from the letter that he wrote. I will... Um, put a link to it in the show notes. I think it's interesting, though, because he's saying some things that we've been saying for a long time and that I've been saying and that I know and that I've, you know, I've actually been chastised for. But let's go over it. Solar and wind are intermittent sources of energy, and we are unlikely to have super cheap batteries anytime soon that would allow us to store sufficient energy for when the sun isn't shining or the wind isn't blowing. So we have all these proponents of renewable energy, that forget the fact that all of the machines and devices that are required to capture the renewable energy aren't renewable and they ignore the intermittency and like I said I'm knee deep in this industry I know the trends even if you did have a battery technology that worked and was able to be commercialized it would take 10 it would take 10 years to co commercialize it to get it through the labs into engineering testing all these things so we're nowhere close and not only that you can't, I keep trying to point out to some people, you can't have an infinite growth in something on a finite planet. All of the things that people are putting forward require that you dig them out of the earth, something that environmentalists don't want to do either. It's not, you know, you just magically sit there and drink, you know, 10 Red Bulls and write an iPhone app to create storage batteries. That's not how it works. People have to go in engineer these things, lab test them, field test them, then you have to set up the manufacturing, then you have to go into the earth and dig all these minerals out that don't really exist in the quantities that are necessary to do what you think you're going to do. So I think people are starting to realize this, and that's why we're seeing these um, uh, moves towards nuclear energy. Let's go on with the Bill Gates quotes. Nuclear is ideal for dealing with climate change because it is the only carbon-free, scalable energy source that's available 24 hours a day. The problems with today's reactors, such as the risk of accidents, can be solved through innovation. Really, the risk of accidents is so de minimis at this point with the newer reactors, we don't even need to innovate. It's already been solved. You know, don't build your reactors on fault lines in Japan and California, and if you do build it in areas like that, reinforce them such that you can deal with the uh, um, tsunamis and stuff like that. I mean, the reactor at Fukushima didn't fail. What failed was the diesel generators that were used as backup power for the cooling water circulation in the reactor. That's what failed. So, um, 
I'm not going to get into the whole climate change debate. I believe in climate change, but not like most people think. And I'll get into that later. But, you know, that is the zeitgeist. A lot of people believe in climate change. And nuclear power, you know, instead of having, you know, Alexander uh, Ocasio-Cortez's $30 trillion green nightmare, you know, why don't we do something like 110? Why don't we build 100 reactors in 10 years or 20 years in this country and think of all the STEM, all the manufacturing, all the high-paying job, engineering and construction jobs that you would create by focusing on something like that that's realistic. Vice uh, the green, uh, renewable green nightmare that can't happen because of physics and math. Um, the world needs to be working on lots of solutions to stop climate change. Advanced nuclear is one, and I hope to persuade U.S. leaders to get into the game. He says other other places in the letter that you know the United States used to be the leader in nuclear power technology, and now we're we're really lagging uh, in the world. And I think that you know from an industrial capability stance, from science, technology, engineering, and math, high paying construction jobs, the whole shebang is covered if you were to transition to a more nuclear focused electrical grid. So I think it was uh, very optimistic to see this and I'm curious to see if the zeitgeist begins to shift from the negative perception of nuclear to more neutral or even positive that would be definitely beneficial for our investments um, as I said earlier volatility this is a chart um, that shows uh, basically the red line is the spot price of uranium and the black line is a composite of various uranium mining stocks. And you can see that typically the price of the uranium stocks tracks the price of uranium, the spot price. But you will see recently during the recent market dislocation how much uh, the stocks, the uranium stocks dropped vis-a-vis -vis the price of uranium. And we said this would happen. I warned people. I said that uranium stocks are stocks, and in a market panic, 95% of stocks would go down, including uranium stocks. This is not, I hope people didn't sell. This is what I'm talking about using fear and volatility to your advantage. While people were fearful and just dumped their stocks because they thought the end of the world was coming and it was 2008 all over again, people had the opportunity to get another bite at the apple. If you have a high conviction that the uranium price is going higher, and you see this type of um, deviation between the price of uranium and uranium stocks, I think you have to be a buyer. And this is a visual that I came, came upon during the week, and I wanted to put it out there. This visualizes and illustrates exactly what I'm talking about, the opportunities that I see are going to happen this year. I expect more volatility. I expect more dislocations. I expect panic selling. Those are your opportunities. You know, I've said it once. I'll say it again. If you can buy physical uranium at a 10 or 12 percent discount to its net asset value like i said that's just like walking over to an open safe in the corner of the room and picking up the money inside it's a no-brainer so you know if you think we're going to have a great financial crisis if you think the world's falling apart if you think energy demand is going to stop or decrease then you probably shouldn't own uranium um, if you think that uh, all kinds of supply are going to come online when uh, the uranium price hits 40 or 50 dollars a pound you shouldn't buy uranium if you see something like this though and you have high conviction that the uranium price will be heading higher for the various reasons we've talked about and you see a dislocation in your favorite uranium stocks that's uh, 180 degrees out of phase from what reality is i think you have to be a buyer and to my previous point this is why i think you have to have dry powder this is how wealth is created people this is how it's done not buying at the top not buying cannabis stocks right now when everybody's buying them. Not buying Bitcoin last November and December. This is how you do it. Buying out-of-favor industries that are down 90% and then they knock them down some more. When you've got all of the wind in your sails. That's how it's done. At maximum points of fear, stepping up and buying. So, I hope this illustrates to you what, we've, what we're talking about. And this is how it's done. This is what I'll be looking for throughout the year. Okay, let's talk about oil. Um, you see the chart. You see the big rally we're having off the bottom. Oil is extremely oversold. 
Uh, there was no way that with the world economy the way it is and using $100 million, 100 million barrels a day of oil every day and growing that the oil price could stay down at $43 a barrel. So this is a dead cat bounce. I don't know how far or how high it's going to go. I suspect that we will turn down again and sell off and maybe test that bottom. I don't know. I'm just speculating. I've taken some positions. Why? Or I mean, I should say I've added to some already uh, positions that I had. Why? Because um, it's the same thing. With the oil price dropping to $43 a barrel, we saw oil stocks just get shredded. Uh, quite a few oil stocks were selling as if the price of oil was selling at $25 a barrel. Um, I don't think oil demand's going away. It's growing every year. I'll get into why in a slide coming up, but... I'm still bullish on oil. OPEC has cut. The Russians have agreed to cut. Canada has cut. Um, we will see the oil price move higher over the year. And I actually think energy prices, the oil price, will be the catalyst for the next recession, not necessarily interest rates. The Saudis cannot have $45 a barrel oil. We've went through the whole thing about the, you know, how they got sold out by Trump on the Iran thing. I'm not going to go. I'm not going to rehash all that. What we're going to see is over the year, I suspect, a stair-step climb, two steps forward, one step back, uh, until the oil price gets to $65, $70, $75 a barrel. I don't know where it ends up, but it's not going to be at $45 or $50 a barrel. Um, I think that represents tremendous opportunity in the long-term thesis on the oil service stocks. They're still, I mean, some of these things were like, got cut by 60 or 70 percent of the stocks I was holding that I already thought were bargains and had been buying them. They got cut and I was in there buying. I have high conviction towards the offshore oil services business and the oil business um, in general. Now the oil business is not, you have to, it cycles. You have to pick, get the cycles right. You know we had this little mini crash pullback a lot of people attribute it to the, you know, the world economy slowing down. You know, I pointed out a chart the other day that quite a few economies may be moving into recession, but I think we have to look at the whole world and not just the developed countries. So I expect this to move higher over time. Um, I don't know how high yet. We'll have to watch things, but uh, that's my thesis. And I th like I said, I think tremendous opportunities are available. I was able to pick up, uh, for example, some preferred stocks of some companies that are basically in the business of shuttling oil, basically a tanker company that's like a pipeline company. They have long-term contracts to shuttle oil from offshore facilities to shore facilities. And some of the preferred stock was selling at 12 to 14% dividend yields. I was in there buying that. Um, Nothing really changed with the business. The cash flow the, the cash flows are not really based on the oil price. They're based on the volumes of oil shipped, and they get paid regardless of the oil price as long as the oil is flowing. So, um, those are some of the things that happens in a panic. People just throw everything out the window. Oh, oil's crashing. Throw all oil stocks out the window. Why would you throw a pipeline stock out the window if it's not anything to do with the pricing? It's just a volume. It's just a toll that you're collecting on the flow. Yes, over time, the oil price, oil flows could go down because investment goes down, but you're talking about lags and pricing that it's just, you know, it, I just don't get it. It's just irrational behavior. So you have to make that irrational behavior and that fear. You have to understand it. You have to understand these markets. You have to understand these industries, and you have to understand that, man, that's an opportunity. I mean, that's what uh, John D. Rockefeller used to do. We have these periodic busts in the oil business. He'd go out and buy all of his competitors. Next thing you know, he's the biggest oil company in the world. So if you don't understand the business, if you don't understand what's going on, then you're just, then you're just gambling. And we don't gamble here. We understand the businesses we're involved with, the industries, and we understand when there's irrational fear and we step up to the plate and buy the bargains. That's what we do at Actionable Intelligence. Um, the oil price will be higher, but it'll be choppy during 2019. Fears of an economic slowdown, slowdown around the world are permeating sediment in the oil market. We're bouncing off the lows that were too low, as I pointed out. I believe this is an excellent opportunity in many oil stocks as 
oil stocks got pushed down to levels that reflected an oil price of $26 a barrel. Too much focus on OECD countries when growth and demand is coming from the emerging markets. You know, why are we talking about oil demand in Germany and Norway? I mean, these are not growth places. This is not where the growth in the world is. Who cares if it's down 1% or 2% because of electric cars? It's irrelevant. Um, depletion never goes away. 3 4 5%, whatever number you want to pick. Um, that means you got to find 3 4 5 million barrels of, of production per day every year and uh, another million to a million and a half in demand. So you're looking at having to find anywhere from four to six million barrels of new production per day every year. And Saudi needs a higher oil price to fund its transition away from oil. They have this uh, 2030 project that's going to cost $500 billion. The current Saudi budget requires $70 $80 a barrel of oil. It, the thing doesn't work at 45 That's why they're cutting. They will get the cut. The cuts will be enforced. They were able to enforce the previous cuts. And that's why we were at $75, $80 a barrel before the recent uh, dislocation. So this is something I want to talk about. It's understanding, it goes back to like, I think uh, one of these wags back in the old and older days said this. It's, it's something like this. I think it was Mark Twain. It's not what you don't know that gets you. It's what you know that just ain't so. And here's what I'm talking about. Okay, all this focus on the United States, the draws on the, you know, imports, the amount of draws every week. Look, when I'm talking about oil and oil demand and the fact that we're going to have an oil crisis, I'm talking about the fact that we have not invested enough money in new production and the development of new reserves. Why? Because demand around the world is relentless. And this is what I'm talking about. Here's a chart of world GDP. And you can see that currently the developed markets only represent 40% of world GDP. When I'm talking about developed markets, I'm talking about the United States. I'm talking about Western Europe. I'm talking about Japan, okay? Every year that goes by, the developing and emerging markets, China, Southeast Asia, talking about Vietnam, Myanmar, Indonesia, Malaysia, India, these places, okay? Sub-Saharan Africa, Latin America, all these different places are emerging markets. Their percentage of GDP goes up every year uh, there uh, as it relates to the whole and that makes sense because those economies are growing those that's where the population is the populations are young and not old like they are in the West so they're going through the growth phase of having families buying houses middle class transitioning to the middle class if we're going to see that growth in those places then it make, makes sense that we're going to see increased energy, energy demand from those places. So this is not hard to figure out long term. We have not been investing enough money in new production and new reserves. Yet the demand continues to increase. Why? Because the emerging markets and developing markets are growing faster than the developed markets, which are stagnant and which are in decline. So these, that side of the equation is getting bigger. The other side is getting smaller. That's why I'm bullish long-term on energy, because energy permeates every facet, whether it's whether you want to use renewables, nuclear, whatever you want to talk about, hydro, oil, natural gas, coal, it's all BTUs. It can all be converted into thermal units, uh, and it's growing every year. So the demand is there, and the investment is not. That's where your opportunity is. I think it's very important to understand this. You know, if you live in the West, if you live in the United States, if you live in a city, you know, you, you, your basis of thinking is just around your area or your, own, your home country bias, as some people say, and not thinking about what's going on in the rest of the world where these massive changes are taking place and require tremendous amounts of natural resources and energy. You know, I just wanted to throw out some select GDP forecasts for next year. This is off the IMF uh, um, website. And these are all, I didn't go into all the ranky-dink countries, but I'll put a link to it. You can go, there's very few countries that are in, the, you know, not growing next year. But these are high population areas. You know, India's got 1.3 billion people. It's going to grow 7.4% next year. 
you know, Bangladesh has got, you know, what, 300 million people, something like that, 150 million, I don't know, a lot, hundreds of millions of people, Myanmar, 50 million people, Philippines, you know, another 50 million, Vietnam, 100 million people, Indonesia, 150 million people, and these places are all growing, and as you grow, and as people uh, get wealthier, their energy usage goes up, they buy car, you know, you go from walking to a bicycle, to a scooter, to a car, Next thing you know, you're getting on a plane and going on vacation in Thailand or Chinese people are going here or these people are going there. So um, I think that's the perspective I try to look at when I look at uh, people talking about well, we're having a worldwide, um, you know, recession. Well, what are we really talking about? You know, the fact that they're electrifying these places and just putting roads in guarantees huge productivity gains, gains and GDP gains over the next decades. Uh, this is why I'm interested in a lot of these countries and invested them in my long-term portfolio because I can just put money in one of these countries and 20 years later it's going to be worth a lot more just because of the fact that the compounding of the growth. But that, you know, getting back to the fact that I said energy usage goes up in compounds over time. So here are my active themes. Uh, they've kind of been the same for a couple of years. They will continue into this year, the things I'm looking at. Energy, like I said, it underpins everything. Not enough um, investment has happened, I believe. If you look at the total amount of energy units required and the necessary investment, it just hasn't happened. Uh, I think that I give you the opportunity in oil and uranium. Agriculture, you're adding 80, 80 million people a year to the population of the earth that have to be fed, yet net, net per capita acreage is going down. So there's less acreage every year per person to grow more food. And, you know, part of the opportunity is, is these things go in cycles also. And I think this kind of, both of these first two themes tie into this third theme, which is, in my mind, the most important transition that's going to happen in our lifetimes and several generations. Um, I do believe the climate's changing, but it's not getting warmer. It's going to be getting, be getting a lot colder and a lot more volatile. Yeah, I believe we're entering a situation with our sun, which is the driver of climate in the solar system and on this planet, not a trace gas CO2, which is a life-giving gas, by the way. Look up photosynthesis if you don't understand that concept. Uh, I'm not going to get into it. I'm not going to debate it. The sun drives climate. The sun goes through periods of excess energy production and then less energy production. You can look up terms like mounder minimum, sunspot cycles. Uh, we are seeing a, I believe, cycle where we are going to be seeing less energy from the sun. And these things are in decades and hundreds of years. So I suspect that, uh, you know, it's not going to go, you don't go into uh, this year, everything's fine. The next year's glaciation. What you get into is, you know, slight changes. And what people don't understand is this. If you were to drop the average temperature on the North American continent by, let's say, one and a half degrees Celsius, you, you cannot grow any crops in Canada. You cannot grow any grain crops. There's no more canola. There's no more prairie wheat. That's over with. And that's, I'm talking about 1.5 degrees Celsius in average temperatures dropping. That's it. There's virtually no grain that can be grown in, in, in Canada. Um, that's just an example. Uh, you're going to see changes in precipitation in different places around the world. And we're already starting to see this. And yet people are clinging to the zeitgeist, clinging, clinging to the narrative that CO2 and man-made gases uh, emissions are driving whatever anomaly happens to happen. The other thing that's uh, interesting, and I will get into this in maybe some further videos in the year, is that during these periods where the sun uh, has less activity, we've seen correlation with higher volcanic activity on the Earth. So that helps exacerbate possibly the situation of the cooling. So there's going to be some changes and they're going to be contrary to what most people think. Uh, that's my view. I've been really, this is kind of like a pet hobby of mine researching this, but I'm very uh, uh, interested in this. I think there's going to be a lot of people that get smacked upside the head. The other 
active theme I'm still interested in, I think is driving a lot of the uh, issues around energy and resource, is the continued urbanization and growth of the world middle class. Um, I've pointed out some articles like where showing how air traffic is taking off in places like India now, as you get an emerging middle class. Uh, you see in all the, a lot of these countries, even ones I mentioned earlier in this uh, previous slides, uh, people moving from rural areas, people becoming more educated, wealthier, moving to urban areas away from the rural areas. And I think we're going to see a continued trend towards that. Uh, and I think that that's going to drive a lot of opportunity that we see in natural resources and energy consumption. So this is my uh, 2019 uh, investment primer. Uh, obviously, we have to stay nimble. It's like a pitching deck of a ship. We're not just going to be planted in one spot. We have to adapt ourselves to the pitch and rolls of what we, what we experience as we navigate through these uh, rough waters. So happy to talk about it in the comments. Don't have to agree with me. Uh, matter of fact, you know, if you have some other points that you want to bring up that, you know, I may have missed or I'm not taking a good look at, happy to look at it. I will, I'm like John Maynard Keynes, you know, when he was asked why he changed his mind about something and he, his retort was, when the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, sir? So I'm open to changing my mind. You know, tell me where I'm wrong and we can have a conversation. So I hope you enjoyed this. Um, like I said, really got a lot of opportunities in the actionable intelligence newsletter. Uh, we were down, you know, not as bad as I thought last year. The uranium stocks in the portfolio really helped balance some of the losses. But I think that, um, you know, our our view around energy is correct, and we will see a rebound this year. So thanks for your time. This is a little bit longer video, and uh, we'll talk to you next week.